Thank you so much, Bjorn. Uh, uh, as you've now heard many times, the headline, the main topic of this year's Bergen Exchanges is law and inequality in times of crisis. Be also because we are in a time of crisis, but also because actually law and inequality will also be the topic next year. This is the limited edition. Many people were extremely disappointed not being able to come this year. We decided that we, a lot of things that we planned for this year. So you will get a new invitation. <laughs> and law and inequality in times of crisis is also the headline for this year's keynote. And I'm extremely pleased that Malcolm Langford accepted to give this year's keynote. And those of you who have heard Malcolm will agree with me. That's always a great treat. Malcolm Langford is professor at the University of Oslo in law. He also has a background from practice, practice as a lawyer, worked the first time I came across Malcolm, he worked for CORE, the Center on, on Housing and Eviction. And actually he was sitting at Optimus and I didn't know because I was in the US. But, um, and then now he's been working at CMI, he's been working, but mainly I'm now at the University of Oslo, where he also is director for CELL, the Center of Experiential Legal Learning, which is super interesting and inspiring to all of us. And he is the co-director of Law Transform. So welcome, welcome. Thank you, Siri. And it's nice to see so many people here today, physically and digitally. Pandemics are not neutral. They strike in a world teeming with diversity and inequality. Horizontal inequalities by income, wealth and knowledge. Vertical inequalities by status, whether it's gender, ethnicity, age, disability and geographic inequalities between regions and states. Almost always, the poorest, the most marginalized, bear the brunt of a pandemic. In the 14th century, the Black Death or bubonic plague reduced the global population by at least a third and the European population by up to 60%. Yet the highest numbers of deaths occurred amongst the poor, living in close quarters, malnourished and overworked. While the wealthy, what did they do? They fled to their holiday, holiday homes, cabins and castles outside in the countryside. It was the same in Oslo during the Spanish influenza from 1918 to 1920, where the highest mortality rate was amongst the working classes on the east side of town in cramped apartments. The current COVID-19 pandemic is no exception to this pattern of inequality. It was of course first referred to as the rich man's disease in Brazil due to, due to its prevalence amongst the global traveling class. Yet Corona's devastating unequal impact on health outcomes across the world is now undeniable. Irrespective of whether we discuss the global north or the global south, lower income groups are one, more likely to live and work in cramped settings, cramp settings, whether in cities or on a bustling river like the Amazon, which increases the risk of infection. Two, they're more likely to have underlying chronic health conditions, which puts them at a higher risk of mortality from COVID-19. Three, they're less likely to have social insurance and health coverage, which decreases the possibilities for social distancing and the ability to be tested, treated and rehabilitated. And four, low income groups have less access to reliable information and the internet, for better or worse, which increases also the risk of infection. The result of all this is a skewed epidemiological footprint. So that's health. It's pretty clear for all of us the inequality effects there. We read about it every day in the newspapers. But let's go to the socioeconomic effects. Here the relationship is more complex. It's more contingent. So let's go back again to the Black Death. On one hand, 
horizontal inequalities in income and wealth did partly increase, okay? So real incomes for workers actually dropped in many areas of Europe. And opportunistic merchant entrepreneurs emerged in this sort of mass devastation to seize land, capital, infrastructure, and skills, okay? And build what were then, in the 14th and 15th centuries, the Amazons and Facebooks, uh, that also the, the Catholic Church also uh, was involved in, established great sort of capital monopolies uh, uh, predating the capitalist age. If we think about vertical inequalities in this time, certain groups were targeted and killed for their supposed contribution to the spread of the plague. Jews, Roma, foreigners, beggars, lepers, and some religious groups. Yet at the same time, the Black Death also contributed to social transformation. Now, feudalism was disrupted. Land prices fell dramatically. The demand for labor rose dramatically <clears throat> as there were so few workers. This meant that access to land increased, there was upward pressure on laborers, and peasant movements emerged uh, into this uh, chaos. And this contributed to the long-term demise of feudalism and serfdom, and partly helped economic inequality, it enhanced polit politically inclusiveness. In some parts of Europe, the aristocracy was virtually eliminated. So, today, what do we see? Well, mostly bad news so far. It's hard to find so many glimmers of hope uh, for you know, positive effects on equality. There's a dramatic difference right now between the haves and have nots. Yes, when we look generally, everybody's affected. Lockdown, social distancing, closure of borders have wreaked economic havoc for everybody. This year, the global economy has already shrunk by 5%. In the second quarter of this year, the economies of UK, Italy, uh, and Spain shrunk by 20%. I saw a figure the other day of Singapore going up, uh, reducing by 43%. Some sectors like tourism, culture, manufacturing have been deeply disrupted. Yet when we look within and across sectors, again, low-income groups, women, other marginalized groups, have particularly weathered the consequences. There's one, a lower likelihood that their work can be performed remotely. Two, they're more likely to be laid off, especially in countries characterized by segregated labor markets, like the US. And three, they have poor access to social security and healthcare. Children in low-income districts and, and countries are, more, are less likely to gain access to education or have less access to digital uh, uh, tools that they need. And women and children are more exposed to domestic violence, particularly when there is a lockdown or curfew. So let's look at the United Kingdom. And let's look at those who work in sectors not affected by the lockdown. If we look at the top income uh, DESA, which you can see there on the PowerPoint, 90% of those there don't work in lockdown affected sectors. But then look at the bottom 10%, 48%, only 48% are in those sectors. Okay? And that's why we can understand why they have been first affected with, uh, with job losses. Also, if we look at those who can remote work remotely in their job, again, the top, the higher income deciles are more able to work remotely, while the low income groups are less likely. Moving beyond the workplace, in Colombia, researchers reported almost a doubling of reported femicides. And across the world, borders have closed for asylum seekers. And many migrants do not gain access to benefits. Even in Norway, it's been a, a struggle. In South Africa, many of the, the very generous COVID-19 relief packages for adults, children's businesses were only for citizens. Thinking about countries, the impact on poverty is likely to be greater in the global south even in the regions less impacted by COVID-19. So the World Bank estimates uh, this will be the first increase in global poverty since 1998, a real you know, threat to the 2030 goals, which have just been discussed. In Sub-Saharan Africa, we're looking at a potential 23 million new people going into extreme poverty and 16 million in South Asia. And it should be no surprise if we look back five years to the Ebola uh, epidemic, which you just saw uh, uh, on, on the PowerPoint. In Sierra Leone, the informal sector was hardest hit, 54% drop in revenues, with female entrepreneurs being most affected. UNICEF estimates that 5 million children lost a year of schooling and may never have returned. In Sierra Leone, and this is where you see how socioeconomic inequalities affect health incomes, there was a 340% increase in mortality but only 2% of that can be attributed to Ebola.
So you get these cyclic effects uh, through society. So that's the short-term effects of COVID-19, mostly negative from an equality perspective. What about the long-term? Could there be a silver lining <laughs> like the Black Death? Could there be some social transformation that emerges out of the ashes of this pandemic? Well, let's go back 10 years to the latest, the last major economic risk crisis we had, the Great Recession of 2019. It's not so encouraging. Some countries, yes, did introduce social protection programs and did maintain them and increase them over time. Yet, many other countries lurched very quickly into austerity, cutting uh, deeply uh, our social programs such that 10 years later, we've seen even greater increases in economic inequality. So today, according to Oxfam, we have eight billionaires who can fit into that golf buggy there that you can see. They own the same wealth as 3.6 billion people, okay, who make up the poorest half of the world's population. That's where we begin uh, today. There are some glimmers now with uh, politics. There is some learning from the last recession. We're seeing greater creativity, generosity, and speed in developing new social benefit programs and expanding access to old ones. Okay, some have described it as a tsunami of cash, which has sort of flowed into uh, the global economy. And this time, the piling up of debt has caused less alarm. Okay, yes, there's some negotiations now in the US Senate. Yes, the frugal four, uh, was it Finland and Sweden and some others who tried to stop the relief package or water it down in the European Union. But generally, there's been bipartisan agreement across left and right of the need to inject cash into a stagnant economy. Look at somewhere like Colombia, okay, moving out of the global north to the south. Under their state of, a social state of emergency, there were 72 degree, decrees for the rich, the poor, and the poorest. From housing, pensions, bankruptcy changes, administration of private uh, healthcare intensive units, reconnection of public utilities, flexible university loan repayments, special loan for farmers, uh, you name it. So there is an amazing experiment now happening in social policy uh, across the world. South Africa has now just announced an intention to roll out a basic income grant. There's been a campaign on this for 20 years. <laughs> Suddenly, uh, the basic income grant has found a friend in the coronavirus. But before we get to positive, not to all countries have been so, uh, you know, inclined. Nigeria, lots of oil wealth, like the country I'm standing in right now. There's been hardly any support uh, to poorer citizens. This is despite the existence of a large informal sector with no sa social safety nets. In the US, political parties are now currently divided on further unemployment relief, despite the fact there are millions uh, uh, unemployed uh, in the US. If we go to somewhere like Peru, where Dargento and Gianella report that the government struggled even to deliver physically the cash and food that was supposed to keep people at home. So people line up at banks, and then there's a greater risk of the infections and so forth. So we've got a mixed uh, picture there, and the question is whether this will be sustained. And will there be accompanying tax reform, which we know from Piketty and others is going to be the key if we want to reduce uh, in, uh, so, uh, income inequality? Will there be sufficient attention to job creation? Will the discussion on gender-based violence generate better policies and mechanisms? That's an open question. So that's mostly politics and policy and, and economics. What about law? Okay, um, the focus of uh, this week. Well, in, crisis, in crises like this, law plays a dual role. Firstly, it helps determine the pre-existing pattern of inequality. And secondly, during a crisis, law and legal institutions affects how we respond to it. And we've seen already uh, in many countries an explosion of law and new institutions. And indeed, and, and, and Carl Servig was, uh, was commenting on this in some ways, one of the most potent weapons a state holds in, in, in a pandemic is a law, a single law called the quarantine, okay, with a very long history, combined with curfews, lockdowns, border closures. And for many people, the power <laughs> of these single legal instruments has been a revelation. Uh, thankfully, though, in most countries, it hasn't been as brutal as before. I mean, if you're a leper or had tuberculosis uh, earlier, whether you're in Norway or South Africa, uh, the effects were quite brutal in terms of going into quarantine. 
or uh, to take an example from Yuen Sunda, in an earlier pandemic in the Nordic countries, going back a few hundred years, Norwegians were permitted by law to shoot Swedes at the border. Uh, because during that pandemic, as now, rates of infection were higher in Sweden than they were in Norway. Uh, thankfully for the Swedes, we're not allowed to you know, shoot them uh, today, but it shows you the power of law in transfiguring uh, our responses. So, how much does law matter for inequality? It's a, a subject of major debate, particularly to the extent to which law can do something positive about inequality. So realists, okay, mostly dismiss law. It's just a reflection of political economy. It's not words on paper doing very much. Marxists, well, they have a very different view. Law is one of the most powerful tools in creating the conditions for a capitalist economy. Institutionalists, well, law is a mediating force to set up the political and economic entities that distribute resources, recognition, and all the goodies uh, and symbols that we have in society. And empiricists, a bit like me, uh, point to all these factors and more. Um, but the key point that should occupy our minds right now is whether the pandemic might allevi alleviate inequality through law and how. Let's go back again to the Black Death, where we started, and take an example from England and a particular law. So, as I mentioned, labor supply drops dramatically, wages threaten to skyrocket, the elites start to freak out, okay? They're alarmed. 1349 in England, a royal ordinance followed up by the statute of laborers in 1350 and 1351. What did they do? It fixed money wages at the pre-plague level, which were already unusually low. So even though there was masses demand uh, for, for labor, they fixed the market. This statute remained in force for almost a century until 1444. And even though there were some you know, geographic exceptions to it in, in, in practice, it shows the power of law to enforce inequality, even when the market actually wants to produce equality. The recent global financial crisis and the, uh, in 2007 and 8, and then the, the Great Recession 2009 is another good example if we take the US. It's a chilling misuse of, of law. So instead of taking over failing banks, <laughs> uh, according to the Nordic model, which was developed in, in 92, 93, the US Congress and Senate basically facilitated the cheap purchase of failing mortgages, okay, of homeowners who couldn't pay their, 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 their money back to the bank by major housing corporations. It resulted in the wholesale displacement of millions of Americans from their homes, which they then often had to rent back at exorbitant uh, uh, prices. So how we respond now is critical. What about courts? We've been talking about uh, legislators. Again, we find a mixed picture before COVID-19. So let's take two happy pictures. Uh, uh, first, the Latvian Constitutional Court, okay, in the midst of the global financial uh, uh, crisis. Um, there was a 10% cut in minimum pensions and a 70% cut in working pensions. Lots of protests on the streets, 16 cases go to the Constitutional uh, uh, Court. And what do they do? They apply the right to social security um, and find a violation. Uh, uh, after going through a proportionality test, because these pensioners would be plunged below a minimum and there are other ways the government could solve the crisis. The same responsiveness can be found by the Colombian Constitutional Court during recessions in the late 1990s, early 2000s. For example, they struck down a market-based formula for determining interest rates for social housing screens, which threatened more than 2,100 200,000 individuals and families. They found that the formula violated the right to dignified housing, and there was a lack of proportionality between, between the scheme's objective of affordable housing and the sole reliance on a market mechanism. But, as always, there's much to critique. Eva Nolan argued that in, from 2009 onwards, courts were more absent and present in seeking to uh, you know, review and restrain the excesses of austerity. In the past three decades, researching courts around the world on social rights, I found they're often very deferential to governments in times of economic crises. And the scholarship of the legal complex shows a strong judi judicial deference uh, to governments, governments in security crises. Moreover, the Latin American perspective provides another 
view on courts and inequality. They may make things worse. So if, according to some, uh, for example, Octavio Faz, the beneficiaries of the Brazilian social rights revolution in the courts are the middle class who have been able to access judicial uh, remedies. In Colombia, scholars also show there was precisely the economic recession of the late 90s, which pushed the middle class in to starting to use the courts to gain better access to social security, health benefits, and so forth. This critique raises a fundamental question for us about law and particularly human rights law. It seems to be egalitarian. You find the word equality everywhere in human rights law, but is it actually egalitarian? So for example, Susan Marks and other critics argue that human rights has been complicit in the rise of neoliberalism. It contributes to, for example, economic and wealth inequalities. Property rights create the structural conditions and human rights discourse legitimates okay, the neoliberal term. Others such as Samuel Moyne and Not Enough have argued that human rights has largely been a bystander, <laughs> not doing much to stop inequality uh, um, or not very much to improve the situation with its focus on civil and political rights and socioeconomic minimums. The question then is, can human rights incorporate more robust notions of equality, particularly there with horizontal uh, inequalities. It's often good on status issues, okay, discrimination, but can it address these more economic-like inequalities? Well, there's three responses that can be made to Susan Marks and, and, and Samuel Moyne, amongst others. The first is the role of civil and political rights. Don't dismiss them too quickly. So the countries have been most successful in reducing economic inequality, and I'm standing in one of them now. It's got worse since the 1970s, but comparatively, pretty good. They also top all of the global indexes on rule of law and civil and political rights. So democratic governance is important. And this observation is almost completely missing in the debate, although institutional scholars have pointed it out for a long time. So in a re recent article in the Law Transform Project with Rebecca Shield and Bruce Wa Wilson on the right to water, we found that the co but by constitutionalizing the right to water, it only really matters when you have better democratic governance. But rights work together in, in, uh, in, in, in improving poverty outcomes, but also some equality outcomes. Secondly, socioeconomic rights theories. The interesting thing about, about Samuel Moyne's work is that up until the 1970s, he acknowledges the constructivist potential in socioeconomic rights. They can be interpreted in different ways. He tracks, for example, the fascinating uh, discussions on social rights in the US in the 30s and 40s, with a rather robust vision of social welfare embedded in these rights. But when he gets to the 1970s, he has a more positivist perspective on, on human rights, some sort of minimalist, essentialist approach which is embedded. Yet when you glance at moral and political theory, law and jurisprudence, you see the ambiguity there. As Ronald Dworkin said, socioeconomic rights can include everything <laughs> from a, a mere minimum through to full socialism. Of course, there's limits in how far you can run these arguments. You can't stretch human rights so long. But we can see if we take, for example, a common ground to defend human rights like dignity, yes, it can lead to a prohibition on torture or hazardous working conditions, but it can also be used uh, for a broader claim to equal respect to social uh, resources uh, and social um, uh, rights and relations. And it's the same can be said if we start with freedom or justice or need or agency. The same in law, if we look at the right to attain the right to health or the right to continuous improvement of living conditions and the international cover of economic and social rights, some of these rights are quite egalitarian. They require an equi equitable distribution of healthcare units. They require that states stop the worsening of income inequalities, exactly what we now have in the 2030 agenda in goal 10.1. Thirdly, the empirical evidence on the uh, distributive harming effects of social rights litigation have been disputed and require some nuancing. So Daniel Brinks um, and, and Veron Garay have found that many low-income groups in Brazil, for example, benefit indirectly as the authorities from the middle-class litigation because the authorities stopped opposing <laughs> the claims and began supplying medication, for example, uh, to everyone. In right to health education litigation, it was actually low uh, income groups that benefited most. Uh, 
The same when we also look at Colombia, we find a mixed picture of the litigation, of the effects of litigation. So all of this is to say that there are resources for egalitarianism that lie in human rights, whether it's moral theory, whether it's law, whether it's human rights practice. It can only be stretched so far. I don't think you can get for <laughs> socialism or social democracy out of socioeconomic rights. But it's up to how these things are used uh, uh, in practice. And that's what makes it interesting. What sort of theoretical argument one can raise, which also is going to fly uh, practically. So, to conclude on four points. What could law do to the, the current pandemic? Are there glimmers of hope when we look long term, um, whether in legislation or court rulings? It's of course rather tempting to agree with William Gibson's famous line, the future is already here, it's not just evenly distributed. Um, but I've tried to find some glimmers of hope, so here's a few positive and negative signs. Four. So firstly, recognition. The pandemic that we have now has generated some recognition of inequality. This has included a better understanding of the role of low income learners, for example, in essential occupations and the health conditions in tightly congested informal settlements. The South African president, for example, has referred frequently to the right to equality and promised that in a post pandemic era, South Africa will do much more to tackle inequality. If we go back to 2009, the focus was much more on social protection. Equally, there's been a greater recognition of some of the distributional consequences of laws that have reinforced neoliberal policies. So decades of defunding or privatizing health insurance and elderly care have partly come home to roost, whether it's in Ireland, the Netherlands, United Kingdom, Australia, or Sweden next door. So one of the great puzzles for everybody was why <laughs> were the rates of infection so high in the premier welfare state in the world, Sweden. And there's various explanations for this, but one of them is the design of their healthcare sector and elderly uh, care, where low wage, uh, uh, in, where you have a model of low wages, cost cutting and decentralized responsibility, and that's complicated the response to infection transmission. So the policy debate is being inflected. Two, lockdown review and the role of courts. We've seen courts playing uh, an active role in reviewing some, down, some of lockdown governance, while others, such as in Norway, we've seen mobilization by lawyers association and social movements. In India, there's been challenges to, for court challenges to health workers' lack of equipment and patients' lack of access to hospital for non-COVID, uh, uh, for example, emergency treatment. In Peru, courts have granted orders to marginalised municipalities that wish to establish local lockdowns and exclude uh, visitors. In South Africa, an alliance of over 300 organisations uh, have monitored police and army brutality. A co courts have halted evictions, which have occurred despite the national prohibition on any eviction during the, uh, the, the pandemic period. And even the president in this case has welcomed the use of courts to challenge unlawful conduct. But the verdict is still out on courts. The key thing is now. How are courts going to respond to increasing inequalities as this infusion of cash <laughs> and other measures starts to have less effect? Will they be responsive or will they sit it out like last time? Thirdly, and this starts to get more pessimistic, authoritarian and business appropriation of the pandemic. The many states of emergencies that we've seen throughout the world should raise concerns. And indeed, many state of emergency powers uh, emerged in the, in, in the early 1920s after, in fact, the Spanish influenza. Perhaps on the good side, many of the large fears of large scale abuse of quarantine laws and states of exceptionism have somewhat subsided. Many right wing governments were anxious to get the economy uh, moving again. But we see clear attempts to appropriate the crisis in some states, the most notable are Hungary, China, and arguably Poland. There's also been an appropriation by business. So crisis packages permit opportunity for greater and long-term state subsidies and tax release for those corporations which are best able uh, to lobby. 
and we're back again to the 14th century and the rise of merchant entrepreneurs. Also, because we're so focused on the pandemic, as some of the early speakers said, we don't see what's happening in other policy fields, where we're seeing regulation and legislation going through on other matters, which never reach uh, the newspapers. We're seeing that in the US, but even in Norway. The fourth uh, sign of things to come is social accountability. Much accountability for enforcing existing legal standards happens outside courts. Okay? It may be labour inspectorates or unions. It may be child protection services, disability support, environmental prosecutors and defenders. These, active, uh, these actors play a vital protective role in securing existing social, civil, environmental rights for low-income groups, for marginalised groups, for women. In the co context of lockdowns, curfews, straightened budgets, the regulation of the economy and private sphere is often left to the markets and families. The quiet background role of law in regulating on a database, day to day based social inequality deserves greater attention. To conclude, the COVID-19 pandemic is only a wake up call on inequalities and the underlying causes, but it doesn't mean we've actually woken up. We've yet to see the structural reforms in many areas, even, for example, low income learners in essential sectors. We're still not willing to you know, perhaps increase their wages by a few cents, despite the role they've played. So the question remains open. What will this crisis be used for? How will the material and symbolic resources that come from calling something a crisis be used? Will it to be, to be enhanced inequality? like recent crises, whether it's the 2009 economic crisis, the 2014 Ebola crisis, or even the 2015 refugee crisis? Or will it be used to tackle inequality? Thank you. Thank you so much for setting us off, getting us thinking, setting us off in such a good way. Very, very stimulating indeed. And we are very lucky to have the commentator for you who has uh, offered to start us off on the discussion, and you've already met him. It's Carla Alsevik from the Faculty of Law. So please. Thank you. And first of all, Malcolm, uh, thank you as always for providing many viewpoints and reflections, and it was indeed well worth listening to. Uh, as you know, I'm a lawyer, so, uh, but you are a social scientist as well, if not by by background, at least by how you present things, but I will keep to the to the law. That's the only thing I, I can. But take it, you took us back in time, and that was a wonderful story about we could kill the Swedes at the border. Uh, I have relatives that are Swedes, so I will not do so. But just curious, you know, if any Swedes were shot. No, no, because uh, not taking the point of your story, because it's a wonderful story. But what is important is partly it's not only about what the law was about, but it's important to emphasize was it enforced. And also, that is a kind of ongoing discussion now private enforcement. Should we have this kind of private enforcement of the law? That can also be problematic. But let us turn back to, uh, to, to the, I think it was many things to touch upon. So I'll just make a selection. And the one question is, will the current crisis change the distribution of power between the legislator, the parliament here in Norway, but that depends on, and the courts and also other actors within the judicial system. But we see, you could expect that the government will be more powerful during a crisis and that the courts will be a bit reluctant to go into issues that they normally wouldn't do, partly due to, because it's a state of crisis, but also other elements. So that's the one question. And also, it will be interesting to see, at least within the European setting, but also in other countries like in the US, will you see the distribution of power between the central, the federal level, and the local, the states in the US, but then in Europe? Will the European Union kind of be more powerful now? Or will it be more power to the nations because they have to tackle the crisis? Uh, I have more questions, but I think we're running out of time. So that was 
the one I had at first hand. Yeah. Thank you, Carl Harlan. You're absolutely right. We are running out of time, but we do have time for maybe a question from the audience, if anybody has something. Otherwise, just for a reply from Malcolm at the end. <laughs> Any questions from anyone? You weren't prepared for this, right? You've been sitting so long in your, <laughs> in your private uh, offices. Lisa. You, no, you have to, no, no, just the boring microphone. Um, I thought I would just follow up on, on your question and then maybe also kind of uh, <laughs> refer to yours, the social science part of your Malcolm, because I think this is one of the issues that you just raised that I think is most pressing at this point is this sort of because the whole kind of global international order is changing we're moving from what we used to call a kind of a unipolar world where you know we had eu and the us sort of being in a sense the the law setters of international global governance and that's no longer the case and so we, you know, exactly what is going to happen, we don't really know, but we just know that there is a competition for the global sort of floor. And maybe there is more, much more of a kind of a regional and national competition. And this is actually hugely worrying from a point of inequality, but not least in the inequality of health, because we don't really know how this is going to affect global governance. I think what we do know is that global governance is changing, but what kind of effects would it have? It's a huge question. So, I mean, maybe you can just nod if you think it's a good question. If you don't, <laughs> I don't expect that, you know, that you can answer it all. So, a short question. Yeah. Yeah, answer from so, two quick responses. I think it's a great question on separation of powers. I think if the pandemic continues and we have we need for more regulation, there's going to be a change in balance of power between the executive and parliaments. Parliaments will lose power uh, in this process. process. We'll see the rise of more and more regulations. Courts in countries which are used to structural litigation have very flexible procedures and have a history of being activists. Okay, Nepal, India, US, Colombia, Brazil, Costa Rica. I think these courts and South Africa to a certain extent will continue to be active and we're seeing that. But those who weren't previously active have very you know, structured procedures will lose power if, if again the pandemic continues. And I think, uh, so it's important to think about uh, democracy and separation of power. I think Lisa's question is also really important. Uh, again, it depends on the length of the pandemic, but we're seeing a new nationalism where, you know, all the states that were, you know, so concerned with the 2030 agenda and, you know, helping the rest of the world and not only help, concerned about getting 10,000 face masks on a plane right now from Beijing uh, to Oslo without it being, you know, stolen by the Americans uh, along the way. That's where we were in March 2020 and it's only got a little bit better. We've pumped so much money into the economies. We have so much debt. We have less space to be generous. And that's not just uh, fiscal space, but it's also mental space uh, to think about other countries. We have seen some sovereign debt uh, relief terms that we could great. The private sector is not particularly uh, concerned. Not all developing countries in Africa have taken uh, uh, it up. So there are real issues on, 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 on global governance uh, at this time. Uh, the election in November in the US will partly determine uh, how global governance will, will, will uh, continue uh, uh, in the future, but it's difficult to know. But if we can end on a positive note, you know, seeing what's happening in Belarus, uh, you know, next door, right now as we speak, sometimes unexpected but positive things uh, can happen in the midst of, of a crisis. And perhaps one positive aspect of the crisis relates also to populism and authoritarianism, which is not based on, on science. And so that we see as perhaps one uh, positive contribution uh, already.